Last time we finished um, the first half of the book of Joshua. And tonight we'll take the second half. And I'm only half kidding. Uh, the next seven chapters are a division of the land. And um, you're spared by the pressures of our forthcoming trip and the break that it will impose upon us. There might be some practicality to trying to finish the uh, next 12 chapters in two parts. A major chunk tonight, and then the wrap-up next time. And um, if we succeed in doing that, it will it'll, it'll, uh, avoid having something dangle for a couple, you know, over a month. Because uh, next time will be our last meeting for a while. Um, because uh, we're going to our trip, our tour is going to Israel, and uh, we will be also spending a little time in Europe after that. So for most of the month of April, we will be uh, out of the country. So uh, now the benefit to you of all of this is that it saves you from the really way out detours that I usually encounter uh, when we get to some of these things. Um, but chap- the first 12 chapters, as you know, uh, are the conquest of the land. And um, the, the last half of the book, the next 12 chapters, have to do with uh, the possessing of the land, the division of the land. Um, chapters 13 through 19 are a, uh, a division of the land. 13 is going to deal with those things that occurred east of the Jordan. And uh, 14 and 15 will be Judah and very specifically Caleb's very unique request and his inheritance. But then, uh, and then chapter 16, Ephraim, uh, chapter 17, Manasseh. In other words, 16 and 17 together are the division of the land to the tribe of Joseph, which is really a double tribe. And uh, chapter 18, we have the tabernacle set up at Shiloh and, and there are seven tribes that remain to be dealt with and Benjamin is dealt with in 18 and then chapter 19 deals with uh, six more, Simeon, Zebulun, Issachar Asher, Naphtali and Dan so by the time we finish chapter 19 the twelve tribes have inherited the land um, now we have a couple of ways of going at this uh, one is just to go through read the text and here and there I can add a footnote or two for what use it might be, but all you'll really get out of that is the insight that I can't pronounce those names either. So there is another thing that I would suggest to you, and I'll only take you part way through it. But this is an excellent time for those of you that the Spirit leads to take on a study of the Twelve Tribes. See, if we were really going to stretch the study of Joshua throughout the rest of this calendar year, what we could very profitably do is take, as each one of these tribes inherit their portion of the land, we could use that occasion to take a look, both historically at that tribe, what it's done, and what it's, what's going to happen to it prophetically. And uh, uh, that is a very, very useful study. Now, if you were to undertake such a study, you'd discover there are two pivotal chapters in addition to the possession of the land here described in these seven chapters, 13 through 19, uh, the place that you would probably start, well, if you're really going to start, what you'd do is go into Genesis and where that particular son was born to Jacob, you would start there. But um, one, another way to get a summary of the tribes is to take note of what occurs in Genesis chapter 49. There are two key chapters that you might make a note of. So in case You might get bored with it tonight. You'll at least have it in your notes so that sometime if you're interested in the 12 tribes, there are two chapters that provide very provocative summaries of those 12 tribes. Genesis 49 and Deuteronomy 33. We're not going to take the time to go through each chapter of those, nor are we going to take the time to detail those prophecies that affect each of the 12 tribes. I'll highlight a few to give you the feeling of it. I will encourage you to do that on your own, but I would also caution you to to let you know that the technicalities in the Hebrew are non-trivial, so you really would want to do this kind of a study with some helps, uh, a good concordance and and some other background, perhaps. But, um, and of course, uh, um, uh, a study of the 12 tribes would start, of course, with the, 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 the son that heads the tribe being born in Genesis, that would carry you through to Genesis 49, which we're going to look at in a minute, where Jacob, the patriarch, at the end of his days, calls his 12 sons, 
which, become, which, as you know, becomes 12 tribes. He calls them together, and he pronounces a blessing on each one. But that word is misleading, because pronouncing a blessing sounds like, you know, bless you, my son, and that's great. What he really does is he gives them a prophecy about each tribe. And some of those prophecies, a blessing like that you don't need. I mean, they're riddles. They're peculiar. Some of them are quite straightforward. Some of them are very enigmatic and require some study. But uh, he does that, and we're going to look at a few of those and see what's happened to them in in the future. Uh, And when we get to Deuteronomy 33, Moses does a very similar thing. Deuteronomy 33 is the occasion where Moses then, many obviously much later, calls the 12 tribes together and gives a prophecy about each one. And those together give you a great insight as to the role or character or destiny of each of those 12 tribes. And uh, if you were going to follow that through, then the next major, each tribe has some adventures, of course, through the Old Testament and also have some echoes in the New. But uh, the next major event for the 12 tribes, where they're detailed, is, of course, here in Joshua, where after having conquered the land in the first 12 chapters of Joshua, they're now going to get their inheritance. This is the inheritance that was promised to them from the beginning. It was the inheritance that encouraged them through the 70 year, uh, the 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And it is now uh, actually going to be allocated. They do this by lot. God speaks to them uh, by lot. We don't know the mechanics. We assume it was the lot of the high priest, the Urim and the Thummim, but we don't know that for sure. That's just assumed. But we do know there was no contest about the lot, so whatever mechanic was chosen by the Lord was accepted by everyone, and the land was allocated. Um, As we go forward, if we were to go forward in our study of the 12 tribes, uh, we, of course, would note their history and their peculiar circumstances that occur through the Old Testament, but we would climax those 12 tribes by their inheriting the land a second time. And they do so in the millennium. And where does that describe? In Ezekiel, the last four chapters. So you'll find that they do. Yeah, we love to, in the book of Revelation, note that the tribe of Dan is not mentioned, but we do know the tribe of Dan does inherit from Ezekiel 48. So um, it would uh, go beyond the scope of our little survey to do an exhaustive study of the 12 tribes on the one hand, on the other hand, it would also perhaps uh, be a f- unfortunate if we didn't at least highlight some of the treasures that are available if you care to do something like this. So we'll try to undertake this and, and make good use of our time uh, that we have. So uh, let's start. We left last time at the end of chapter 12. We're now going to take, try to just take a quick survey of seven chapters. Um, chapter 13 is sort of easy. Chapter 13 really deals with the inheritance of what's called the two and a half tribes. That's the two, the two, uh, Reuben and Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh, which as you may recall, had elected, when they were still under Moses, they had elected to take their inheritance east of the Jordan. And if you uh, sketched a map, uh, Reuben took the southern chunk, just east of the Jordan from the Dead Sea up a bit, uh, Manasseh, then the next chunk, and, uh, excuse me, uh, Gad, the next chunk, up to about the Sea of Galilee, and uh, that part which is northwest of there, Manasseh took, or the half tribe of Manasseh took. So these had uh, decided they liked what they saw, they carved that out for themselves. Moses says, fine, that sure is, as long as the men of war stay with the nation through the conquest of the land west of the Jordan. And once that's over, they were welcome to go ahead and take that. That, uh, purport, that portion. So that was all agreed under, under um, Moses, and it's described in uh, Deuteronomy. But uh, here is that was in a sense of a, in a predictive sense. Here in chapter 13, now Joshua goes ahead and in effect executes uh, those commitments, and um, it um, it goes on. And uh, if you go through it, if we took the time to go through chapter 13 in detail you'd really find it does little more than highlight the borders and the details of all of this, um, uh, of of the Reubenites and the Gadites and uh, the half-tribe of Manasseh. Um, Now, um, it also... um, I'm pausing because I'm not sure how much to get immersed in all of this um, because it, in a sense, is history. That is history before the book of Joshua. Um, The one thing, if you pick up in um, 
Verse 13. We're going to find this again and again throughout the division of the land. In fact, we get the impression that only Caleb was thorough in his situation. That uh, in in many cases, the uh, Israelites did not cleanse the land completely of the inhabitants as they were instructed to. And if we track each time that they don't do that, it becomes a thorn in their side. In verse 13, it says, Nevertheless, the children of Israel expelled not the Geshurites and, nor the uh, Machathites, but the Geshurites and the Machathites dwell among the Israelites to this day. And uh, indeed, uh, this is a failure. It is through the resident, the, the remaining of those, that the idol worship starts to enter the land again. And it's also, the uh, you'll discover if you study your history carefully, it's through those areas where that was the strongest that Assyria gains her foothold in First Chronicles 5 and elsewhere. So we're going to discover that uh, that's a problem. It occurs to me that before we go into this much, uh, it might be good for us to pause and let's let's take a detour to Genesis 49 and take a look at uh, that situation. Now, to refresh your memory, of course, uh, the main part of the main story in Genesis is from chapter 12 on is the story of Abraham and the emergence of that family. Abraham is called as an idol worshipping Gentile on the east of the Euphrates. He's called by God, and he ultimately does, in fact, uh, uh, be, be, become the beginning of God's work, calling a special people. And uh, Abraham has supernaturally has Isaac, and uh, and uh, Isaac has Jacob. And as you know, Jacob marries two women and has two other concubines. The four women give birth to twelve sons. And uh, and uh, I won't take the time here to recap all of that. But these twelve sons of Jacob become, as you know, the twelve tribes. And it's worth your study. Make a little chart understand the order they were born and who they were born of. That's a worthwhile study. We won't take the time here to detail it, but you can easily just do it by tracking Genesis. You'll discover that Leah uh, had the first few. And uh, um, um, she, uh, um, Rachel was very jealous and had her handmaid give birth to a couple, and then Leah thought that was a good idea, so she had her handmaid give birth to a couple, and then ultimately, of course, uh, uh, Rachel does bear two, but uh, Joseph and Benjamin, and under, under Benjamin she dies, and her grave is, uh, she's buried near Bethlehem, and it's one of the things you visit if you visit there. But the point is, these 12 sons then become the 12 tribes. One other point, as you all know the story, under uh, the Joseph was, of course, sold by his brethren into Egypt, into slavery, and into Egypt he ends up becoming the prime minister of Egypt, and the prosperity of Egypt brings the family under his protection and, and uh, nurture in Egypt. Uh, while in Egypt, Joseph has two children. He takes a Gentile bride, has two children, M- Manasseh and Ephraim. When Jacob comes to there when they all lived together after that whole dramatic episode chronicled near the end of Genesis. Um, Jacob does a very important thing. He adopts the two sons of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim. And when uh, Joseph presents the two children to Jacob for the blessing, uh, he pl- positions the oldest by the right hand, uh, uh, namely Manasseh, and the youngest by the left, Ephraim. But Jacob does a strange thing. He crosses his hands in giving the blessing, which dis- which disturbs uh, Joseph, but somehow the Lord, through Jacob, knew what he was, you know Jacob knew what he was doing, and he was putting the younger ahead of the older. Ephraim has ascendancy, if you will. Uh, it's one of the several places in Genesis where God, on the one hand, endorses the concept of the firstborn; on the other hand, also asserts his sovereignty to reverse it on the occasion. You know, Esau, Jacob. There are a lot of places, so that's a whole study, and it's right. But the point is, this gives you then thirteen sons of Jacob if you count the two that were adopted. Well. 12 plus the 2, but the 2 are under the 1. So you've really got 13 tribes to choose from. And we've talked about this many times, and I don't mean to overemphasize it, except I went through many years of confusion, because no one explained to me there were really 13 tribes. I always was puzzled. There was 12 tribes, and yet if you wanted to count, if you didn't want to count Levi, you still got 12. If you wanted to count Levi, you got 12, and so on. So it turns out what you do is Joseph can be counted as a tribe of Joseph, or if you need because you're trying to exclude Levi for some particular reason, you can take Joseph and call him Manasseh and Ephraim. So you've got really 13, a list of 13 to make 12 from. There's still only 12 tribes, idiomatically. 
But there's 14 names to play with, right? It's the old shell game. And if you're just a young student in the Old Testament, you can really stumble on that. You get to the book of Revelation, and the tribe of Dan is not in the list of the 12 tribes that are sealed, but there's 12 tribes sealed. You really have to note that Dan is not there, how they pull that off. Well, they, they uh, obviously they include Levi. In that case, drop Dan. And you also discover Ephraim's not n- n- named, but he's implied, because they mention Manasseh. And then they mention the tribe of Joseph. Well, if you already mentioned Manasseh, what's left of Joseph is Ephraim. So two th- Holy Spirit's doing two things. He's not listing Dan, and he's also not mentioning Ephraim. So there's, he's giving them the back of the hand, and there's a whole lesson behind that um, that you can study. You know, the Holy Spirit does not, in all the chronologies... Uh, well, we're getting ahead of the game. Back in... Yes, we're getting way off the field. I'm not going to make it, am I? Um, yes. Um, Jacob, at the end of his days, calls his family together. And in Genesis chapter 49, we need to go through this because I think you'll find it great fun. And this will give you a flavor of some of the things. We could do the same with Deuteronomy 33. And it's, uh, it's, it's, this is the kind of study that is worthy of its own merit. So uh, I'll just give you a taste of it in the, in the theory that the Holy Spirit will lead you to go on or not, depending on your own needs. But uh, Genesis 49, verse 1, Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you. When? In the last days. Interesting phrase. Um, so this is prophetic. It's not just a blessing like... Bless you, my son. It's a blessing like he's going to tell them what's coming. And you'll get this. You see what he says. You recognize two things. It's prophetic and it's also enigmatic. There's some real mysteries buried in in, uh, Jacob's comments here. Verse 2. Gather yourselves together and hear ye, sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Israel being the other alternative name for Jacob, as you know. And... uh, that's also a whole study, but I better keep moving. The, fir- he takes it, the firstborn is Reuben, so he takes them in that order. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, thy might and the beginning of my strength, the ex- excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Sounds good so far, doesn't it, huh? Yeah, well, Reuben, you got some problems, Reuben. Um, And you'll be joyed to know I'll be doing this from memory because I've misplaced my notes on Reuben. Okay, fine. Good, that's all right. That'll spare you a lot of trivia. Um, the first, verse 3 sounds great, doesn't it? If you were Reuben, that sounds, you know, you're feeling pretty, your smile's on your face because Dad's talking pretty good here. He says, the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the uh, excellency of power, right? Period. But he continues. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. Because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, thou defilest thou it, he went up to my couch. And uh, what this is referring to is where Reuben um, uh, uh, violates his father's concubine. You'll find that d- miserable story in Genesis 35, for those who want to chase it. You can also find that Reuben is unstable, and one of the chronicles of that is in First Chronicles chapter 5, first couple of verses, for those that want to chase it. But I don't want to make too much of Reuben right now. Reuben does, by the way, take, one of the, take his, his portion east of the Jordan. Now we get to verse 5. The next Jacob talks to are Simeon and Levi. He said, and he, he lumps them together. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are, are in their habitations. O my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly. Mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now, what he's referring to is a, an incident that occurred, and you'll find this in, uh, hmm, I forgot the chapter, but what happens is Jacob has a daughter by the name of Dinah, and a man in Shechem finds her in the field and takes her, takes advantage of her, rapes her. But then he wants to marry her, and uh, Simeon and Levi um, lay on this guy a colossal lie, saying, great, we'll welcome you if you get circumcised, because that's our, that's our way, which, of course, they do, which, of course, he does, and that weakens him. And while he's weakened, they slaughter him and all his relatives. And it's a brutal ambush slaughter, so much so that it really offends Jacob. It really 
uh, gave them a bad name in the community. And uh, so Simeon and um, and uh, 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 and Levi are uh, are uh, you know tarred with this uh, brutal murder of uh, of uh, Shechem. So what Jacob is prophesying here is that they will be divided and scattered in Israel. Now, one reason I'm bringing this up, it's kind of interesting. Of the 12 tribes, there's only two that don't have a specific inheritance. One of them is in a negative sense. One turns out to be in a positive sense. Levi and Simeon at the moment from here have a cloud over their head, right? Well, now we're going to move ahead in, in, in the, through the Egypt experience. We get to Moses. You remember Moses going up on the hill to get the Ten Commandments? And while he was gone, there was a golden calf bit, remember? When he comes back and finds all that, he says, Who, all those of you that are for the Lord, come with me. And who stepped forward? Levi. All the Levites. And that was a display of loyalty at a very critical time for which they're rewarded. Because what God then pronounces throughout the wilderness experience, when they get in the land... The Levites are not going to inherit land in, as all the other 12 tribes. What they get for their inheritance is the Lord himself, in the sense that they are the, pre, the, the tribe from which the priests are. So what the Levites get, in, instead of a, a, a contiguous chunk of territory, what the Levites get is a special role within Israel of taking care of the things of the priesthood. And they, instead of getting a chunk of land, get 48 cities, Six cities of refuge, and we'll come to that later, and 42 more. There's 48 cities that are cities of the Levites. The nation Israel would tithe to the Levites, and then the Levites would tithe to the priesthood, those that are actually serving as priests. And so that was the structure. So the Levites had a very special role. That's why when you count the army, when they mustered the camp for war, the Levites were not counted because they took care of the tabernacle um, and so on. So... It's interesting, when we get, I'm looking ahead now, but when we get into these, into Joshua and the land is divided, we're going to discover that Simeon doesn't get an area all of his own. It turns out that Judah, by the time he gets allocated, Judah has more than he needs, so Simeon just co-shares that. So the area that's Judah is, includes the inheritance of Simeon. So Simeon is scattered in Judah, interestingly enough. Now, Levi also is scattered in the land, but in a more definitive sense with these 48 cities. So this prophecy that Jacob is moved to give them here in Genesis 49 turns out to be very true, very literal. But I want to come to the most important one, as you can probably gather, and that's verses 8 through 12. This is Jacob's prophecy on his son Judah. And bear in mind, Judah's uh, conduct wasn't too neat, you know. I mean, there was a whole bit with Tamar and what have you. Judah has got, uh, uh, you know, if you really want to write his report card, it's bad news. However, that is not on Jacob's mind. Jacob's prophecy of the tribe of Judah is far more provocative. Um, verse 8, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Now, it's a pun, because the name Judah means praise. But thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. I wonder why. Who comes out of the tribe of Judah? David. And, of course, ultimately, the Mashiach, the, 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 the Messiah. He says, Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Thy father's children. In other words, the rest of you 11 guys, in other words, your brothers, are going to bow down before you. That means he's going to, the, what he's announcing here, in effect, is a foreshadowing of the monarchy. There's no monarchy even talked about. That's going to come later in 1 Samuel, right? But the monarchy will be established out of Judah. Now, if that puzzles you, it should, because Saul, the first king, came out of Benjamin. But that was sort of a temporary thing that the Israelites kept pestering the Lord, so he says, fine, I'll give you a king. They weren't ready. He was preparing David from the beginning. We learned that from our study of Ruth and the, the, uh, the prophecy that was given to Boaz and Ruth when they married and had a, had a son. And it was the tenth generation from Paris, namely 
David that was to be the king. And it was of the line of Judah, not uh, not Saul. So that's a whole other issue. But um, it goes on. Uh, we know from Jacob is here in the end of, in the end of Genesis uh, prophesying that the Ju- Judah would be the royal line. And uh, it goes on. There's some interesting uh, Hebrew language here with some puns in it. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Now, uh, I don't want to try to unravel all of that, but you can begin to sense there uh, some puns which lead, give rise to the expression, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And indeed, when John in the book of Revelation is before the throne, and there's a seven-sealed book in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, and the word went out, no man in heaven, uh, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And John says he sobbed convulsively because no man was found worthy to open the book. And one of the elders says, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open the book. And John turns and sees what the lion know but a lamb. The Lamb of God and the Lion of the tribe of Judah, in effect, are synonyms. The Lion of the tribe of Judah is the Levitical phrase, the Matthew phrase, the Jewish phrase. The Lamb of God is also a Jewish phrase, but specifically um, his sacrifice on our behalf. But those are the two sides, if you will, the priest and king side of the Messiah. But it goes on, verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The word Shiloh can mean peace. It also means the coming one. And here it is generally regarded among the rabbis as being messianic. Now, what makes this thing interesting, as you know, of course, uh, after Joshua in the land came the time of the judges, then the kings, there was uh, Saul, David, Solomon, then the civil war, the monarchy broke. Um, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, that's the northern kingdom went into idolatry. The Assyrians were raised to take them into slavery. And then uh, several, I guess a couple hundred years later, but finally, but Babylon rises and Judah, which did a little better, but also declines into idolatry. God raises Nebuchadnezzar to judge them, takes them into the Babylonian captivity. By then Babylon had conquered the Assyrians, so they're all commingled, that is the slaves are. And um, after the uh, Babylonian captivity, they are, um, the Cyrus the Persian releases them to go back in the land. They reestablish themselves in Jerusalem. But, of course, after the Persians come the Greeks, and after the Greeks, the Romans. Now, during all this time, they had some measure of self-determination uh, until um, the um, deposition of Archelaus. Now, uh, after, uh, at, when the Romans took over, they put a king, namely an Idumean, not a Jew, someone from Edom, an Idumean by the name of Herod in charge and set up the Herodian dynasty. Herod, of course, not being a Jew, but trying to be popular with people, mounted this huge building program which modernized the Nehemiah temple and did a lot of other buildings in an attempt to create a, some popular support. But what happened, and this is recorded in Josephus and it's also recorded in the Talmud, is that uh, under the deposition of Archelaus, um, um, under the reign of Caponius, they did an interesting thing. They took away their right to capital punishment, that is the Jews. They took away from the Jews the right to capital punishment. They may wonder, well, what that's got to do with anything? Well, if you study Genesis carefully, you know that the right to capital punishment is the, indi- indi- is a, uh, is the um, indication of sovereignty. It's the indication of self-rule. If you have the right to, to enforce capital punishment, you're in charge of yourselves. If you're not, then you're not. So that's one of the concepts in the Scripture. And they were denied the right to capital punishment uh, at approximately 7 A.D. under Caponius from the deposition of Archelaus. Now, what happens then, and the Talmud describes this, is that the high priest and the priests put on sackcloth and ashes, and they went through Jerusalem weeping and mourning because they believed that the word of God had been broken. What they said was, Woe unto us, for the scepter has been taken from Judah, and Shiloh has not come. That's in the Talmud. Um, and I, You get the references. Um, now, why did they believe this? Because of, this, of Genesis 49.10. They believed that the scepter was not depart from Judah until the Messiah was to be on the earth. And they wept, tore, they had the sackcloth, ashes. They really believed that the word of God had been broken. What they did not know was that just a little further north, up in a place called Nazareth, there was a young boy that was somewhere between seven and ten years old, that maybe, or excuse me, between ten and twelve years old, that was uh, in a carpenter's shop, probably uh, helping his dad. And uh, he makes his appearance a little later. But it's interesting that uh, how the scripture is. 
It goes on here too about binding his foal into a vine, the ass is cold. It goes on some other things that I don't, I won't try to unravel here. Uh, just skim, th- while we're here in Genesis 49, it might be useful to skim some of these other tribes. Uh, verse 13 speaks of Zebulun. Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea, and he shall be for a haven of ships, and his border shall be unto Sidon. Zebulun, the northwest corner of the country, uh, close to Phoenicia. We'll see when the lots are, are, are thrown. He's up in that area. And it talks about uh, Issachar, uh, also up in, generally in that area, up in the Galilee area. There's a strong ass crouching between two burdens. He saw that rest was good, and the land was pleasant, and he bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto forced labor. Dan shall judge his people. The word Dan means judge. As one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent, by the way, an adder in the path that biteth his horse's heel so that his rider shall fall backward. Strange, enigmatic phrase. Much studied by the rabbis. We do know that Dan seems to have been singled out by the Holy Spirit. Not just in Revelation chapter 7, but all through the Old Testament. Because every time there's a chronology, uh, Dan seems to be sort of slighted. Um, the... Um, he, uh, there's some reason to believe he was the oldest of Bilha and Zilpah of, of the concubines. He's the um, he might have been. There's some reason to believe he might have been the ringleader in Genesis 37 against Joseph. But that's an imp- impression. Uh, in Genesis 46, the names of the sons of Dan are not given. There's some tr- Hebrew phrases that make it sound like Hushim and Shushem are, but they're really just tribal names. They're not the list of his sons like the other in each of the twelve tribes. Numbers 26. Again, his descendants are not named. It's as if that each time that the Holy Spirit, there's a chronology of each of the 12 tribes, Daniel, Dan's descendants seem to be uh, blotted out. He's also omitted from the genealogies in First Chronicles chapter 2 through 10. And, of course, he's famous for not being listed in Revelation 7. So the Holy Spirit seems to have something against Dan. The premise that we generally trade on is that it looks like it was through Dan that idolatry entered the land. And uh, he's being, in effect, uh, carrying that burden. It's almost as if the Holy Spirit's reluctant to mention his name. He has mentioned last, Numbers 10.25, his standard is always to the rear. In Joshua 19, he's going to be the last to inherit. In First Chronicles 27, he's mentioned last again. And uh, so uh, uh, we could spend more time uh, dealing with Dan, but uh, I'm not sure there's a lot of value for us tonight in that. The, the, the golden calves were first set up in Dan and in Bethel. And that's what, uh, and this is First Kings 12 and Second Kings 10. You'll find uh, 100 years later they're still there in Second Kings 10. So Dan seems to be a source. He, uh, uh, you'll discover that he has a parcel given to him in, uh, in, in the mid part of the country, but he takes an additional chunk way up north, and it's that, that's the chunk that seems to get everybody into big trouble. Are all the people in Dan bad? I don't think so. His parents, Seth Samson, were pretty good people. They were out of the tribe of Dan, and Samson himself, those days, he's, he is uh, in the book of Judges as one of the, maybe the relative high spots out of the tribe of Dan. So he, Dan ain't all bad. But he does seem to have uh, a problem with the Holy Spirit. He does give him a tough time. But moving on here then, in verse 19, in Genesis 49, it says, Gad, a, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. The word Gad, Gad has an unsettled existence. Uh, uh, the word troop there means a marauding or plundering troop. It can, it's a word in the Hebrew that conveys uh, motion and movement. Uh, the word Gad means that. We still have that expression in our language. You hear someone called a Gad about. It's interesting that those, those linguistic links are still there. Um, in uh, Deuteronomy 33, Moses' comments uh, imply that he's uh, unsettled, warlike, and, uh, and he sought and obtained land before Canaan was divided. See, again, he's grasping rather than waiting. And, and um, so uh, his land uh, of Gad is known as Gilead. Deuteronomy 3 comments on that. And uh, there's a, a lot of prophecies having to, to uh, do that. He is vulnerable. He's one of the first to be carried into captivity in First Chronicles 5. And, uh, but he is an end-time overcomer, and mentioned specifically in Jeremiah 49, the first two verses, and Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for those of you that want to get about Gad there. Um, out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and, and he shall yield royal dainties. Um, Asher is, again, another uh, study. Uh, with Zebulun, Naphtali, and Issachar, he's in the northern part of the land. Uh, he's sometimes called half-Gentile tribe because he's also tangled up with Tyre and Sidon. That area called Phoenicia, the seaports, the ones that uh, deal uh, with uh, commerce and, and the luxuries associated with that. And um, the, um, 
we could go through a whole study of Asher, but uh, you, you, with a good commentary, you can do that on your own. Uh, let me just keep uh, let me just keep moving here. Um, uh, Naphtali is also up in that area. Uh, Naphtali means wrestling. Uh, it's sent forth, loosed, and so forth. The Barak is of this tribe. He has a victory in Judges four and five, um, and uh, Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazin are are uh, are. Uh, in the area of Naphtali. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well in Genesis 49-22, whose branches run over the wall. Um, and uh, Joseph is in the area, what we're going to talk about Ephraim, and that's where the, the woman at the well is, and indeed is a fruitful bough. So uh, we can, we can uh, um, pick up some of this as we go. What I'm going to suggest we do at this point, so I don't get too derailed in these side issues is uh, dig right into Joshua uh, and let's just see some of the actual inheritance uh, that's going on here uh, and, and as I say in Joshua 13 most of it has to do with those tribes east of the Jordan uh, from south to north it is um, Reuben, Gad and uh, the half tribe of Manasseh um, and it goes on through the chapter, listing the cities and the borders. And uh, again, uh, I'm not sure this will mean much to you. Most of you in a study Bible have maps uh, that describe the the approximate location of these territories. Some of them are quite well understood. Some are not. If you compare different study Bibles with different sources, you may find that some of these maps that describe the various tribal territories don't quite agree. Don't let that disturb you. There is some um, scholastic uh, debate about some of the boundaries, and so it's not a big deal, uh, but you, you should, just so you are aware of that. One thing that bears a comment in passing, when you get to 1322, we find this interesting character by the name of Balaam surfaces. Interesting character. He shows up uh, in Numbers 22, 23, and 24 in that range, and he's an interesting guy. He's a prophet. He has prophecies. He has some very interesting prophecies, some Gentile-oriented prophecies that capture your attention and mine. He also has a, a prophecy which seems to relate to the star of Bethlehem. It may or may not. There's some doubt about that, but it does have that overtone. But Balaam is more well-known for the fact that he sold out. He, although he was a prophet, and he obviously pro- spoke uh, of the Spirit of God, on the one hand, he also sold his gift and uh, shamed himself. He shows up three times in the New Testament. Yeah, the way of Balaam, the error of Balaam, and the doctrine of Balaam are mentioned respectively in Second Peter two, and uh, in uh, I think it's, uh, um, uh, Jude eleven and uh, Revelation chapter two. The way of Balaam, the error of Balaam, and the doctrine of Balaam. The basic issue being that Balaam um, conspired with Israel's enemies to, in effect, uh, educate him how uh, to take advantage of Israel. And, uh, and he does so, and that's, that's what's referred to in, in the Revelation letter in chapter 2. Um, the, uh, but the main thing is he sold his gift, which is uh, obviously uh, something that uh, was unfortunate. Uh, he's also famous because his donkey, if you recall, would not go on the path, right? And um, uh, in fact, it's too tempting. We can't help but pop back there. Turn with me to uh, Numbers, I just uh, 22. Uh, Numbers 22 uh, is where um, you have the prophecies of Balaam, but um, the donkey is blocked. Uh, uh, he stops, and Balaam's upset because the donkey won't go forward. And verse 23 of Numbers 22, it says, The ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and I want you to notice something that this angel had done. He has his sword drawn in his hand. Does that remind you of Joshua 5? Kind of interesting, isn't it? And the ass turned aside out of the way, and he went to the field, and Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. And the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, and, and a wall being on this side, and a wall being on that side. Now, he's really blocked. And uh, when you get down here, it's interesting that uh, verse 31, the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And what does he do? He bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. Okay, so he worships him. Now, it's not quite that emphatic here, but it's interesting. Uh, it's my, I can't help but uh, I can't escape the idea that this is the same person that Joshua encountered in the end of Joshua chapter 5, for what it's worth. And, of course, uh, uh, the Lord uses a donkey to, uh, to uh, 
explain the madness of Balaam to himself. And he goes on in, in, in 23 that um, uh, we have this peculiar dialogue between Balaam and uh, and uh, the king, and you guys can dig that on your own. It's in chapter 24, verse 17, that you have the star, of, a star out of Jacob, which is some people feel might be a hint of the Bethlehem star. It may or may not be. And uh, so I'll let you fish out Balaam himself, but he, Balaam's a, is a bad actor. And we find out in uh, Joshua chapter... Now, incidentally, the whole idea of Balaam as a prophet is an interesting one. There's some interesting prophets floating around the Old Testament. Um, and... Uh, I love to put on my Jewish friends about trying to get them to prove that Elijah was Jewish. And it turns out you can't do that. He probably was, but he's a Tishbite, whatever that is. And so I have some fun with him on that, uh, that score. But anyway, in, uh, back to Joshua 13, uh, Balaam is killed here. Um, the, children, the Israel slay him with a sword. And uh, he dies with the Moabites, the Midianites. Uh, you'll find that in Numbers 22, 7 and 31, 8 and some other things. He cannot serve God and mammon is the basic theme of that story. And uh, verse 23 goes on about Reuben and gives the, the boundaries right on through. And uh, then the, the uh, um, Manasseh, verse 29, on the half-tribe of Manasseh, takes some portion on the east of the Jordan, too, and that's detailed out there. And then the chapter closes, verse 33, But unto the tribe of Levi Moses gave not any inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance, as he said unto them. And this leads to chapters 14 and 15. And uh, 14 and 15 are uh, both relate to Judah, the tribe of Judah. And uh, it's interesting, uh, bear in mind, see, chapter 13 deals with allocations already determined east of the Jordan. So the first lot, the first provision of land in the new territory of uh, Judah comes first, which is interesting. And very specifically, Caleb is our hero. Caleb is quite a guy. Caleb was, a, a, in a sense, a joint hero with Joshua. You all know his story, how the, how the 12 spies back in Numbers, 14, uh, 13 and 14, where the spies uh, were sent. Ten came, gave a bad report. Two, Joshua and Caleb, gave a good report. They were not terrified by the giants. And uh, uh, when we read that there, we always think giants is just exaggeration. Joshua and Caleb found they were, they were real giants, but they still weren't scared. And uh, Caleb serves faithfully and makes a request. And that's what chapter 14 uh, deals with. Um, and these are the countries uh, which the children of Israel inherited from the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers and the tribes of the children of Israel distributed for inheritance to them. By lot was their inheritance, as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses, for the nine tribes and for the half tribe. See, so in other words, there's nine and a half left to deal with here. And uh, Moses had uh, given the inheritance of the two tribes and a half on the other side of the Jordan, but the Levites, he gave no inheritance among them. For the children of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. Therefore, they gave no portion unto the Levites in the land except cities to dwell in with their pasture lands for their cattle and for their substance. And that's going to all be dealt with, incidentally, in chapters 20 and 21. Uh, the Levites very specifically in 21, but that includes chapter 20, the cities of refuge, and we'll, we'll take that next time. Oh, well, anyway, when we get to those chapters. Verse 6, um, And the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, and the, the Genesite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing which the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart... Uh, heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. It's interesting. Wouldn't you like to be able to say that in a, in a public assembly that knows your track record? That I wholly followed the Lord my God. Completely. That's dynamite. What a report card. Moses swore that day, saying, Surely the land whereupon thy, uh, thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, he said, these forty and five years, ever since the Lord spoke this word unto Moses. While the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. In other words, 85. Now, you may not be impressed with that, but he's going to end up picking a tough mountain, and he has to kick out three giants. Remember these six-fingered, nine-foot-six characters we talked about with the children of Anak, right? There's like three of them left in this mountain that he decides to pick, a place called Hebron. And uh, Caleb doesn't sweat it. He's 85, but he's, they're no match for him. He's an interesting guy. It would be interesting to really do a study of Caleb. He's a, he's a fascinating guy. He says, uh, uh, As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now. For war both to go out and to come in. 
Now therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day, that thou heardest in that day how the Anakim were there, and how the cities were great and fortified, and if so be, the Lord will be with me, and I will, shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and said unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Hebron for an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of uh, Jephunneh the Kenizzite, unto this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. The name of Hebron before was Kiriath Arba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakim, and the land had rest from war. I don't know why that phrase is in there, because we're going to find it a little later that uh, you know Caleb sort of cleans out these Anakim. Um, uh, in fact, he even gives their name in the next chapters, I recall. Uh, he doesn't, uh, Caleb doesn't mess around. He's the one guy that really uh, cleans up uh, his possession. Uh, and uh, it's interesting. It was apparently the spot that they first spotted. That's why maybe one of the reasons that Caleb was impressed with it. Uh, Hebron is uh, also where Abraham and Sarah are buried. And a handful of others. I've forgotten all the interesting people that are buried in Hebron. Hebron is a very, very key place. It's uh, also a point place worth studying in terms of its the different the, the enormous series of, of biblical events that transpire at or near Hebron. But anyway, Caleb picks it and uh, cleans out the Anakim, and it's his. 15 continues this whole issue of Judah, because Caleb being part of the tribe of Judah. Uh, 15, thus this, this then was the lot of the tribe of the children of Judah by their families. And then it goes on with these borders, which uh, I'm not going to try to w- you know, wade through, because it's just a lot of difficult pronunciations and, and so on. But... Uh, uh, you might skim. When you get to verse 8, you pick up a few interesting things. The border went up by the valley of, of the son of Hinnom unto the south side of the, of the Jebusite, the same as Jerusalem. The Jebusites are supposed to be purged. They were not. They failed to do that. The Jebusites ended up becoming stronger. It's David much later that has to, to capture uh, Jerusalem from the Jebusites. Uh, but anyway, they're there, and it says... Uh, uh, the border went up to the top of the mountain, which lieth before the valley of Hinnom, westward, which is the end of the valley of the giants, northward. So there again, we have the valley of the giants highlighted. And uh, uh, then it goes through these place names, which are very difficult to talk about without having a, a map in front of you or slides or something, in which we are not availing ourselves of here. So we'll just keep moving. Verse 14, And Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak, Shishai, Ahimam, and uh, Talmai, the children of Anak. And he went up from there into the inhabitants of Debir, and, named, and, and goes on. Um, and he takes, uh, um, he says, uh, Caleb says, He that smiteth Kiriath Sefer, and taketh it uh, to him I will give uh, Asak my daughter in marriage. Right? And Othniel, which means the Lion of God, by the way, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it, and, and he gave him Asaka's daughter in marriage. Uh, so um, this guy uh, you know, succeeds Joshua and is the first judge, and we'll see that in the book, next book, the book of Judges, deals with this. Um, and uh, it came to pass when she came unto him, she moved him to ask her father for a field, and she lighted from her donkey, and uh, Caleb said unto her, What what is thou? She answered, Give me a blessing. Thou hast given me the thou hast given me for thou hast given me the Negev, that is the, the desert. Give me also the springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs, and this is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Judah according to their families. And I suppose if you want to peel that onion, you can probably find some type of, you know, it's tempting there. You've got typology, you've got a bride, you've got the springs of water. You can, you can get carried away with that if there's some validity to it. But then it goes on then to talk about more borders all the way through to the end of, uh, of the chapter. Verse 63 of chapter 15, As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out, for the Jebusites dwell in the children, uh, with the children of Judah in Jerusalem until this day. And uh, so... Uh, You'll find out that that uh, uh, they'll uh, uh, get at this in, in Judges chapter one verse eight, but the Jebusites uh, recover that, and uh, it's in Second Samuel five that we see them again. So you can follow Jerusalem. The Jebusites is a whole other theme of, of uh, worth uh, getting into it. Now uh, we now get to um, the portion that is allocated to Ephraim. Uh, both six, chapters 16 and 17 are Ephraim and Manasseh. That is the two tribes that make up what you could call the tribe of Joseph. And uh, so uh, uh, I, I might take this opportunity to mention something else. Um, the tribe of Ephraim turns out to be important to you as a Bible student for lots of reasons. 
Um, as you know, uh, after the twelve tribes live there, the, after after Joshua passes away, there's a period of the judges, and that's a period of decl- a moral decline, leading, of course, ultimately them clamoring for a king. They get Saul for a while until David's really until God has David really ready, and then David succeeds Saul, and um, and after David Solomon, and after Solomon, there's the civil war between Jeroboam and Rehoboam. The nation Israel has a civil war and splits into two halves, if you will. The southern half or, or chunk, which is called the House of Judah, because it corresponds approximately to the land grant to Judah, which was Jerusalem and southward. The northern part of the land was called the House of Israel. So don't get confused. You have the nation Israel, but it's in two halves, the House of Judah and the House of Israel. Many times, prophets speaking to Judah really mean the whole country. So the word Judah, which means the house of Judah, the southern half, many of the, many times it's used idiomatically, meaning the whole land. Likewise, the northern part, being the house of Israel, many prophecies you read in the Old Testament are aimed at the house of Israel, and it sometimes means the northern kingdom as opposed to the southern kingdom, because the northern kingdom declines more grossly than the southern kingdom does. Neither The history of either one is very exciting, but the northern one gets pretty bad and gets... Things go from bad to worse, and they get uh, judged by being taken captive by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom uh, under Judah has from time to time some kings that are better than others, and they have slight revivals, but they also ultimately decline. They go into slavery of the Babylon. In the prophets, though, they often will speak of the northern kingdom, house of Israel. They sometimes will speak of Ephraim, which is one of the major portions of land making up the northern kingdom. So many of your your passages in the Old Testament speak of of poetically of Ephraim, but they speak of it connotatively. The analogy I might draw, we're here in Orange County, and sometimes I might be talking of Orange County as opposed to L.A. County. Sometimes I might speak of Orange County as being idiomatic of Southern California as a lifestyle or something, right? Other times I might speak of Orange County as idiomatic of the United States. From my context, the way I might be using the phrase of Orange County, you know whether I'm speaking of it denotatively, in other words, as a county as opposed to L.A. County, whether I'm speaking of it connotatively in the sense of being idiomatic for a lifestyle of Southern California, as opposed, say, to Northern California, or where I might be speaking of Orange County as our lifestyle here in the United States as opposed to the Far East or Europe or something. You with me? Well, in the Scripture, you'll find prophets speak of Ephraim that way. Sometimes they'll speak of Ephraim as a tribe. Sometimes they'll speak of Ephraim as idiomatic of the northern kingdom because it, it included the place called Shiloh. It, is, it, 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 it uh, 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 poetically connotes the northern kingdom. And there are some places where it speaks of Ephraim as one of the twelve tribes and speaks of it as the whole nation. So you want to be sensitive to that. Um, okay, anyway, uh, chapter 16... Uh, we're dealing with Joseph. Joseph was, Ra- was Rachel's firstborn. Jacob loved Rachel more than life itself. Some of the, some of the dimensions in the Hebrew of, of J- Jacob's feeling for Rachel is, is extreme. And uh, as you can imagine, his, uh, 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 Rachel's firstborn, Joseph, was Jacob's favorite. That led to the, to the special robe that he got, whether it was of many colors or seamless is a point of linguistic dispute, but the point is clearly the whole story of Joseph is one that he was favored among his brethren. So Jacob uh, did favor him. Benjamin, her second one, the one she died in childbirth, was one that probably had problems. And we'll discover that Benjamin, uh, while he's the youngest um, and uh, very beloved of Joseph, because he was his natural brother, if you will, um, Benjamin becomes the most fierce and warlike of the bunch. Benjamin's a tough guy. And uh, so uh, as you understand the, the family, you can begin to understand how Benjamin turned out that way. Benjamin's a rough guy. We have, well, we get to Benjamin a little bit. Joseph, uh, the lot of the children of Joseph fell upon the Jordan and Jericho and the water of Jericho to the east and the wilderness that goeth up from Jericho unto the Mount Bethel, goeth out from Bethel to Luz, and it gives you the borders here. So the children of Joseph... Uh, Manasseh and Ephraim took their inheritance. The border of the children of Ephraim, according to their families, was this, and it lists the border. And then um, that's the southern part, if you will, and then Manasseh is to the north. And you, if you have a map, it'll lay that out to you. Um, if you're looking at Judah, the strip that's 
just above Judah is Benjamin. There's a little band in there. And then comes Ephraim and then Manasseh as you go up north. And uh, in fact, Jerusalem is technically in the territory of Benjamin. Um, but as you get further north, when you get to Shiloh and all of that, that's all in, in the area for Ephraim. Um, and again, as we get down here, we discover that uh, the um, uh, last verse of the chapter, they drove not out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer, the Canaanites dwell among the Ephraimites unto this day, and shall and, and have become slaves to do forced labor. So on the one hand, they didn't ca- drive them out as God instructed them. And that causes them problems. Ephraim is, in fact, synonymous with idolatry. One of the theories about Revelation 7 is that Dan is not mentioned, is not sealed because he was the entrance to idolatry in the land. Ephraim is there, but mentioned by the, but not by name, by, by using the name of Joseph to represent that tribe. And, uh, because Manasseh is mentioned, and then Joseph, what's left is Ephraim. And again, the theory being that Ephraim had a part in getting, letting idolatry enter the land. And again, because they didn't cast out the Canaanites. You say, well, gee, they weren't strong enough. Well, there's two arguments to that. One is with the Lord, they're plenty strong enough. They just need to deal with the resolve. But secondly, they apparently were strong enough to make them forced labor. So uh, uh, you sort of get the feeling of some carnality behind that lack of faith, okay? Chapter 17, portion of Manasseh. There was also a lot for the tribe of Manasseh, for he was the firstborn of Joseph, to wit, and it goes on, and uh, builds you the... the uh, um, the geography there. Now, there's one thing here that I do would like to share with you that's kind of fun, and that this whole issue of the daughters of uh, Zelophehad, and or however you pronounce it. Uh, back in um, um, Numbers 27, if you'll turn with me to Numbers 27, you find an incident occurs. These Zelophehad had, had uh, five daughters. Um, and um, these five daughters, he had no sons, see? So this creates a problem. He, uh, he uh, was afraid of getting disenfranchised because all his, you know, there's this, uh, the land is going to be laid out by genealogy. Oh, by the way, something you should recognize. The land is proportioned by tribes and within the land by families, which gives you some indication why genealogies are so important to the Hebrews. It wasn't just pride. It was land grant. You didn't sell land, you leased it. When you sold land, you, you know, you, we've been through that. And it came back to the family under certain circumstances, with the kinsman redeemer as described in the book of Ruth or under the Jubilee year and so forth. So um, you know, this is all important. But anyway, so um, Zelophehad, or however you pronounce his name, uh, is concerned because he's got these daughters and he has no sons, right? And so uh, when we get to Numbers 27, the first 11 verses deal with this issue. Then came the daughters of uh, Zelophehad, uh, uh, the son of uh, Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Maker, the son of Manasseh. He's all going to come up under Manasseh when we get to Joshua. Uh, the son of Joseph. These are the names of the daughters, Mala, Noah, Halga, uh, Milcah, and Tirzah. They stood before Moses and before Eleazar the high priest. You know, and he points out, their father died in the wilderness. He was not in the company of them who gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but he died in his own sin, had no sons. In other words, he wasn't, either, they're, they're, they're making his case. He was a good guy. He wasn't part of the rebellion. Why should the name of our father be done away from all his, among his family? Because he hath no son. Give us therefore a possession among the brethren of our father. And Moses brought their cause before the Lord, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, The daughters of Sephelis, Zelophehad, uh, speak right, they shall, thou shalt surely give them possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren, and thou shalt cause the inheritance of their father to pass unto them. Thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a man die and have no son, then ye shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter. Huh? Now, um, many of you may have heard good or bad things about uh, the Schofield Bible. I'm not here to buy or sell that, but you might be interested to know that it is widely credited to uh, Mr. Schofield, Dr. Schofield, quite apart from his notes on the Bible. Schofield is regarded as one of the guys that first observed the fact that on this, Dr. C.I. Schofield is credited with having been among the earliest scholars to recognize that on this commitment to the daughters of Zelophehad links one of the claims of Jesus Christ. Because Heli had no sons, he had a daughter by the name of Mary. And uh, it's interesting here that the Lord's claim to the throne of David, because he was not born of Joseph, he was born of Mary. 
And uh, in Numbers 27, verse 8, it says, If a man die, etc., and we'll put Heli in that place. You'll also discover in Numbers 36, instructions are given that they must marry within the tribe. Well, well, Mary and Joseph were both of the tribe of Judah. And of the, more than that, they have the house of David. Hmm? So it's kind of interesting there's a link here. Now, if you find that kind of interesting, I'll let you run with your own theories about the fact that you've got five virgins here. And go to Matthew 25, and you've got the ten virgins, the five, and the five. You can run with that one if you like. Uh, you can get in a deep trouble, so I won't. I'll let you do that on your own. The daughters of Zelophehad. Anyway, in, in, uh, while the commitment was made under Moses, back in Numbers 27, here in Joshua 17, they come up and say, hey, Moses said, remember he promised, and Joshua says, hey, you're right on, and, and, and they, of course, go forward and give them their inheritance here. And uh, it goes on and, and, and carries you through the boundaries of such of Ephraim and Manasseh and carries you uh, all the way through that. You'll also find that... Um, the Manasseh, uh, by the way, it's really interesting when you look at a map, because Manasseh's got this big chunk of land up north of the Galan, uh, east of the Jordan, and then they've got this big spread here. If you look at the map, you'll see that the area involved is quite a chunk of land. They're still not satisfied. They, they'd like some more. Joshua, Joshua says, there's a great mountain. It, it's, it's full of parasites, but you're welcome to it. Of course, you've got to get rid of the parasites and cut down all the timber, but, uh, and they say that's a good deal, and so they go after it. He says... Uh, he says, uh, Thou art a great people and have great power, and shall not have only one lot only, but the mountain shall be thine. In the last verse of chapter 17. For it is a forest, and thou shalt cut it down, and the borders of it shall be thine. For thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though they are strong. So, okay, guys, if you're that, uh, you know, ambitious, uh, go to it. Go, to the, go after the iron chariots and the Canaanites and cut down the timber, and it's yours. Now, chapter 18 now uh, it's going to deal with two things. It's going to, the tabernacle is going to be set up. You see, there's actually three places that the land is allocated. Uh, the two and a half tribes east of the Jordan, that was done under Moses before. What we've talked about up till now was done at Gilgal, base camp, right? Now they're going to set the tabernacle, tabernacle up at Shiloh. This is in the area that would be, uh, I believe, under, in the area of Ephraim. And uh, this, is a, this is a big event. The tabernacle now, is, which has been wandering wandering, 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 now gets a, a permanent residence, permanent for a while, at Shiloh. At chapter 18, the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there, and the land was subdued before them. Okay? And so... Uh, okay. Um, and if you're studying the tabernacle, this is, this is, a, this is a major event of it being... Uh, set up there. But then it continues there. It remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet had received their inheritance. Okay. Benjamin, Simeon, Zebulun, Issachar, Asher, Naphtali, and Dan. Don't forget, see, Levi is set aside. So there's seven more to do, and that's going to take place in chapters 18, and what's remaining of 18 and 19. And uh, uh, that should uh, move right along. Um Verse 2, And there remained among the children of seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. Verse 3, Joshua said unto the children of Israel, How long are ye tardy to go and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers hath given you? Appoint from you three men from each tribe, and I will send them, and they shall rise, they shall go through the land, and describe it according to the inheritance of them, and they shall come again unto me, and they shall divide unto seven portions. Judah shall abide in their border of the south, and the house of Joseph shall abide in their borders of the north. In other words, there's two bands now. There's still more land, but there's two major bands. Judah to the south, and this large band divided between Ephraim and Manasseh um, there. And so he's sending these uh, 21 guys, three from each tribe of the seven. That's what we assume they are. And uh, they, they, they're sort of, it's, it's sort of the old deal with your brother, you know, when you had an apple to divide. You divide it, and I'll pick the half kind of thing. Well, what they're going to do is divide seven portions, and then the Lord will provide his will through the mechanism of lots as to who will get which part. That's basically what's going on here. So they describe the seven portions. In verse 7 it says, The Levites have no portion among you, for the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance. And Gad and Reuben, the half-tribe of Manasseh, have received their inheritance beyond the Jordan, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. And the men arose and went away, and Joshua charged them that they went 
to describe the land, saying, Go and walk through the land and describe it and come again to me that there may, that we, that I may here cast lots for you before the Lord in Shiloh. And the men went and passed through the land, described the cities into seven portions in a book, and came again to Joshua to, uh, to the host at Shiloh. And Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord, and there Joshua divided the land unto the children of Israel according to their divisions. There's always a tradition that this was done with the Urim and Thummim, but I don't see that the, uh, we go through the high priest, but it's not clear that that's necessarily the mechanic being used. It's, the Holy Spirit of Son is the actual mechanic is that they used as to casting the lots, but clearly that the Lord's will is being reflected in that lot, and, and it's clear that there's nowhere a murmur or a complaint, that they, uh, there seems to be a universal acceptance of, of the results. Uh, the, the next uh, one to come up is kind of is Benjamin, who is the, uh, the younger of the two born to Rachel. Uh, Benjamin is uh, the lot of uh, tribe of the children of Benjamin came up according to their families and the border of, of the lot came forth between the children of Judah and the children of Joseph and their border on the north was uh, from the Jordan and the border went up the side of Jericho to the north side anyway it gives the borders here it's a band that incidentally includes Jerusalem and Jericho and Gilgal it's right in that interesting zone between Judah and uh, uh, the, the uh, Ephraim and uh, it goes, it describes this. It includes the hill that lieth on the south side of the lower of Beth Horon. Interesting parcel of ground, really, because it does include, at the very southern tip, it does include Jerusalem, does include Jericho and Gilgal, but it also includes the valley of Beth Horon, the long day thing. So the, the band that belongs to Benjamin is an interesting strip of ground. Um, now, um, um I had some notes about Benjamin, but, um, yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, he's the fiercest, most warlike. I think I mentioned that to you. You find that in Judges 19, 2 Samuel 2, 1 Chronicles 8 and 12, and 2 Chronicles 17. You find that Benjamin is right in the scene of the action. He's his bunch of, uh, tough bunch of guys. Something else, Benj- the tribe of Benjamin is also the source of a lot of heroes. Ehud in Judges 3 comes out of the tribe of Benjamin. He's a pretty... A rough guy, but the two that you probably know the best is King Saul. Now, when Israel wanted a king, they wanted a big, tall, handsome, you know, super guy, and they 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 had their eye on Saul. And First Samuel twenty-two and Second uh, Samuel four, you'll find that Saul is is you know, as as a human judge would pick, pretty glamorous guy. He's out of the guy of the tribe of Benjamin. There's another guy that's quite a hero that comes out of the tribe of Benjamin. And it's another Saul. This Saul has an experience on his way to Damascus, and he becomes Paul. And in Acts, excuse me, in Romans 11, chapter 1, we find that, uh, among other places, that Saul says he was not only a Jew, but he was a Benjamite. He's uh, from Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. So Benjamin is a source of, of uh, uh, you know, some, some uh, pretty uh, going guys. Um... Well, in any case, the, uh, we have the the the, uh, the tribe of Benjamin laid out as uh, I've indicated, and it goes through the rest of the chapter. From uh, it, it describes the borders and it descri- lists the cities that were in in uh, those areas, and uh, and you can read that through. And the cities will be of two kinds: those that will be very familiar that I don't have to point out to you, and those that are unpronounceable we've never heard of, and I haven't either. So we can just go to the uh, we, we sort of uh, um, conclu- chapter 18 includes concludes the inheritance to the tribe of Benjamin according to their families. Now, chapter 19 is a wrap up of six more: Simeon, Zebulun, Issachar, Asher, Naphtali, and Dan. Um, Simeon, chapter 11, uh, verse 11. I mean. Uh, through, excuse me, verse 1 through verse uh, 9. 10 is Zebulun. Verse 17 starts Issachar. Verse 24, Asher. And verse 32, Naphtali. And, and uh, verse 40 on, we have the tribe of Dan. So uh, we can sort of skim through that. Uh, Simeon, if you recall, was the one that Jacob had prophesied would be scattered. Uh, you find here that... Uh, that uh, 
the uh, uh, verse 9, it points out that out of the portion of the children of Judah was the inheritance of the children of Simeon, for the portion of the children of Judah was too much for them. Therefore, the children of Simeon had their inheritance within the inheritance of them, that is, of the Judah people. And so uh, it's detailed there, but uh, what the real point of it is it's scattered within the, the zone that's called Judah. And uh, from for, for the most part, the land, the southern portion of the, how, the land of Israel is Judah. And, uh, and, and uh, the northern edge of Judah doesn't quite include, but for practical purpose, does include Jerusalem. If you watch a map closely, it's technically in the zone called Benjamin, but it's obviously uh, as the city of David and so forth. It becomes, in other words, from there on south through Beersheba, the, the whole the Negev. It's, you don't hear it called the land of Judah and Simeon. It's usually the land of Judah as such. Partly because, again, because of what uh, the, civil, the, the, the uh, legacy of the Civil War. Um, okay, so we get to verse uh, 10. We now have Zebulun and their families. The border of their inheritance was under Sarid. And uh, now this is up uh, both uh, uh, Zebulun, Issachar, Asher, and Naphtali. While we'll go through this, if you think of them as the northern part of Palestine, the northern part of the land of Israel, including Galilee and over to, to Haifa, uh, you've got... Uh, those pieces in, in, in various uh, uh, shapes and sizes. So this whole bunch and uh, borders and stuff is, is the northern part. Um, and we can skim through. Don't be confused with verse 15 where it speaks of Bethlehem. There's two Bethlehems. That's why the prophet Micah, so that you would not be confused, says Bethlehem Ephrathah, which is the Bethlehem that's just near Jerusalem. So interestingly enough, uh, 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 the prophet was led to focus on which one we're talking about. Um, inheritance of the children of Zebulun according to their families, their cities and villages. And we go, go through uh, Issachar then, verse 17 on. And it gives the, those, uh, spreads that out, which if you're interested, the easiest way to do this is check it with a map because many of these cities are require some scholastic digging to really understand which ones they are. Fifth lot is the, 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 the children of Asher. And um, you can go through that. That includes Tyre and so forth, and and uh, let's see if I have some any particularly exciting insights into Asher and so forth. I don't think so. They're close to Phoenicia and what have you. I think I've covered that before you, for you before, so uh, we uh, I think we're we're okay there. Um, um, yeah, Asher is from verse 24 on, and um, uh, again, I'm going to just forego my uh, demonstrating my inability to pronounce these names. Um, the sixth lot comes to the children of Naphtali, or Naphtali, or Naphtali, or however you pr- pronounce it, um, even for the ch- uh, according to their families, from verse 32 on. And... Um, and skimming this over, I don't see any major things that I can contribute. We get to verse 40. The seventh lot came out of the children of the, uh, the tribe of the children of Dan, according to their families. And uh, uh, there's Zorah, Eshtel, uh, um, and it goes through these various names, which lie, uh, if one will pick up verse 46, with the border before Joppa. Now the Joppa, city of Joppa, is is um, uh, is the place who who sailed from Joppa? Huh? Jonah, right? And, and if you visit that, you're visiting a suburb of Tel Aviv. To give you a rough feeling for where that is. So the tribe of Dan has a zone that's there, just north of the Philistine area, or roughly in that area, um, and that may confuse you because the the Tel Don is way up in the north. And what really happens here is you'll find that Dan is uh, the uh, verse forty seven. The border of the children of Dan went out too little for them. Therefore, the children of Dan went up to fight against against Leshem and took it and smote it with the edge of the sword and possessed it and dwelt in it and called Leshem Dan after the name of Dan their father. This is the inheritance of the tribe of Dan, children of Dan, according to their families, whose cities. Those these cities were the villages. So way up in the northern part, in fact, um, either uh, you're north of the city of uh, north. If you go up the Dead Sea, up the Jordan, you splits the you know, splits the east and west there. Then you get to the, the Sea of Galilee. If you keep going north, there's another lake, and I forget the name of it. Quite a ways up there. Now you're in Lebanon, really, by today's geography. 
up in that zone, right on the border up there, is the, the area, also an area uh, associated with the tribe of Dan. And so don't get confused. They, they carved out for themselves a small zone up there. But that's where the golden calf was set up in later years, shaming Israel, or the house of Israel, the northern kingdom, and causes Dan all kinds of problems. So if Dan had confined themselves with what they had, the Lord had given them by lot, they might have stayed out of difficulty. They went ahead and got themselves some more, and that uh, turned out to put them in proximity to the Assyrians and these pagan cultures, and they end up becoming a, uh, a vulnerable element for the, uh, the uh, uh, nation um, Israel. Verse 49. And now, now we get to for the last three verses of chapter 19. Boy, we're really ahead of schedule. Amazing. I must have left out a lot. Uh, when they had finished dividing the land for inheritance by their borders, the children of Israel gave an inheritance to Joshua, the son of Nun, among them. According to the word of the Lord, they gave him the city which he asked, even Timnath Sarah in Mount Ephraim. And he built the city and dwelt in it. And these are the inheritance which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the children of Israel divided for an inheritance by lot in Shiloh before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So they finished dividing the country. Now, um, I'm not going to go any further because, um, well, I'd like to leave the rest for next time. But... Um, it does. Uh, this does conclude, if you will, a major chunk of of, of uh, God's program. Um, and one of the things you need to wrestle with, and we talked about that up front when we first got into this into this uh, study, is uh, what the land really means. Um, uh, and what do I mean by that? Well. What does Canaan typify? You know, we've talked about Joshua historically. We've talked about Joshua prophetically and mystically, about the Jubilee year and all that sort of stuff. One of the things has to do with Joshua practically. We haven't talked a lot about that here and there a little bit. Um, We've talked about Joshua as a type of Christ, as a namesake, uh, his role as prophet, priest, and in a sense king. He's a commander and so forth. We've talked about... um, um, a lot of different dimensions here as I look this over. Um, We've talked about Joshua uh, 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 um, mostly in the mystical sense. Uh, But let's talk a little bit about Joshua in the practical sense. Um, We can point out a couple of things. Uh, Joshua, the book of Joshua deals with a predestined inheritance for for the chosen people. Right? Israel was predestined to the land, right? So God could have taken them right out of Egypt and put them right there, right? But he chose not to. He he required them to take the land and possess it. The land wasn't empty. It wasn't just a nice, neat valley with fruit trees growing around. There were people there that had to be dispossessed. The Amorites... Incidentally, were probably the power in Egypt that caused the Egyptians, you know, to, it was the, the Pharaoh that turned against the Hebrews, it was not an Egyptian, Isaiah tells us. And uh, the Amorites may have been the original source of anti Semitic feelings in Egypt, causing their subjugation and enslavement. The Amorite power was, in, uh, was, was held sway for 600 years, and the power of the Amorites was broken in the Battle of Beth Horon that we talk so much about in the long day of Joshua. So uh, it's interesting that on the one hand, Israel was predestined to the land. They were chosen for that land. God had set up that inheritance. And yet they had to take it. They had to possess it. They had to assert their faith. How about you and I? Are we, as, are we chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ? Sure, before the foundation of the world was laid, the scripture tells us. Do we have a predestined inheritance? Sure. That's what the book of Ephesians is all about, right? Check the first chapter, and you can't miss that point. What do we have to do to get it? Just sort of sit back and, hey, lay it on me? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe uh, what Joshua is intending to teach us is that there are some things about us 
where in Joshua we have Israel entering and possessing the land. In Ephesians we have the church entering and possessing its inheritance. Of course, in Joshua it's an earthly inheritance, and in Ephesians it's a heavenly inheritance. In Joshua it was given to Abraham, and in Abraham, and in Ephesians it's given in Christ. So there are some differences. I don't want to misapply this. Um, in both cases, the inheritance is opened by a divinely appointed leader, leader. Yehoshua in the Old Testament and Yehoshua in the New, if I use his Hebrew name. In, one, in each case, it's a gift of grace, but received by faith. A gift of grace, but received by faith. Okay? Um, Okay, and we could go on more more about this. But then the real question is, 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 what is the difference then between the wilderness and the promised land? You and I have been called out of the world, right? Been called out of Egypt, right? We all, I think, are familiar with how God has set up Pharaoh and Egypt to be a type of Satan and his world. A world that we're in, but redeemed out of, called out of. And we partake of that redemption in the same sense that uh, Israel was taken out of Egypt, across the Red Sea. You know, we talk about baptism, right? We're, 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 our baptism is analogous, if you will, to Israel's baptism, if I can use that phrase, of coming through the Red Sea, right? Well, that's dynamite. Uh, and we all, I think, are wandering in the wilderness, right? We have our setbacks. God uh, wants to bless us, and we murmur, and we groan, and we fuss, and, and, and he teaches us lessons over and over and over again. And uh, how often we really should pray, that uh, not for the burden to be lifted from us, but rather that the lessons not be wasted this time. Uh, I remember someone at a funeral, a uh, tragic loss for a family, and they were bereaved. And the friend of mine who led the the prayer at that occasion did something that startled me at the time. I've thought a lot about it since. He says, Father, we pray that these lessons not be wasted. And so sometimes God does strange things to get our attention. And um, I had to speak at a time when, uh, at, a, at a family funeral where the, the gal was in a rest home for many, for many years and was senile, actually. And, and you often wonder, why does the Lord keep her alive for so long? And then she finally did pass away in the family gathered and they asked me to make a few remarks and I don't know why the Lord gave it to me but that uh, why did the great grandmother why did he keep her alive so long under all that misery and in, in, in a senile state and, and the position I took I said maybe it's because he wanted us all here now that, that not be wasted that he might hear that through her testimony we might gathered here understand the resurrection and the life and so forth and that he might use that life in that sense so uh, Anyway, we, we are in the wilderness, and we have these lessons over and over again. Well, that, that's great. And we have these songs that sing about crossing over Jordan in the flavor that we're going to heaven. And so we often think that, gee, going across and possessing the promised land is like us crossing. Crossing over Jordan is for us to pass over to that eternal state where we have a resurrection bodies, we're with the Lord, everything's going to be peaches and cream. Until we study Joshua. Hey, these guys crossed the Jer- Jordan, and there was Jericho. That was pretty neat. But then there was Ai. That wasn't so neat. Thing, you know, and, and then we had Beth Horon. And they had to, uh, you know, they had to march these, uh, you know, 30 miles overnight. That's tough, moving a group that large, that far, that fast, at night. Forced march, and then have battle before it did dawn, you know. And, and, and pray that the day will be extended so we can finish up. Uh, you get the impression if, if the promised land is heaven, you mean it's going to be war in heaven? Is there going to be defeat in heaven? I don't think so. So what's heaven and what's Jericho as opposed to the wilderness and the Red Sea for you and I? And I have some thoughts that I'll leave you with. And we'll talk more about this next time because we're going to talk about some other things, cities of refuge and, and, uh, and Joshua's final challenge. But um, we, you and I, are living a contradiction. We glibly talk about his om- omnipotence and yet we're faced with our helplessness. Is your life totally victorious? Mine isn't. And yet he's an omnipotent God. What are we talking about? Uh, uh, We talk about union, but is it without communion? Okay. Do we have profession without real experience? Do we have life without health? Do we have movement without progress? Do we have war without victory? Do we have service without real success? Do we have 
trials without triumph. And the suggestion I'm going to leave you with, is it, that, is it possible that you and I might be on the right side of Easter, but the wrong side of Pentecost? Is it that, yes, we've come to the cross and we are saved? Yes, we, are, we have a Savior. We're called out of Egypt. But is it possible that we have yet to enter into His rest? to yet be fully empowered by His Spirit? and Or are we caught between this no-man's land of the wilderness wanderings, this 40 years that God, that they didn't need to do? Are you and I entangled in a walk that's less than adequately powered? And um, I'm not here to get into a whole Pentecostal trip. That's not my nature either. But... Is there a power for us? And I say I'm at Pentecostal in the extreme sense. I'm talking about the idea of being empowered by the Holy Spirit to really understand what happened at Pentecost and that we might not only have his pardon, but that we may also have his power. And I suspect that's what really the book of Joshua is all about. That's one of the things that, uh, that uh, he uh, deals with. You and I need to be obviously out of bondage, out of the bondage of sin, out of the bondage of the world and its things and its grip. But maybe some of us aren't in Canaan yet. Still warfare, but warfare with victory. What victory? Victory of the Spirit. Romans 7, 1 Corinthians 3. You can jump into that on your own. Uh, we've talked about idols, I think. Do you worship idols? Are there idols in your life? Do they have a command of your life? Any affections can be idols. Any unyielded resources can be idols. Any, uh, any uh, areas of a lack of compassion can be idols. Any pet doctrines that might be true but might uh, be uh, derailing you from a balanced walk in the whole counsel of God can be all. All these are potential challenges, things that we can talk about next time. When we get together next time... We'll be attempting to conclude our review of this interesting book, and we'll really have uh, three subjects. We'll talk about the cities of refuge, and those of you that are, want to do a little homework, I encourage you to do a little homework about the cities of refuge. You'll find them in Numbers 35 and elsewhere. The, str- the strange idea for a manslaughter guy. If you killed somebody without premeditation, you were entitled to run to one of six cities. There were three east of the Jordan, three west of the Jordan. And if you could make it there, the, the, the cities were never locked. If you could make it there, you were safe from the avenger of blood. And the classical model was if someone was killed in your family, the eldest son went to avenge the blood. And uh, it sounds sort of Italian, doesn't it? It's actually, a, or Bedouin or whatever. Well, that was, the, that was the concept. That was the way they enforced it. And if, it was not, if you were not uh, guilty of uh, a premeditated murder... And you could get to a city of refuge, you were safe. Why? Why did God institute this very peculiar technique? And by the way, you were safe there. You had to st- excuse me, you were safe as long as you stayed in the city, and the city council conv- you convinced them that you were, it was a non premeditated situation. Then you were safe there until the death of the high priest. Now, it's not a high priest of the city, the high priest is in, in, in uh, Jerusalem. Or, or wherever, but, or at the tabernacle, wherever that was set up. But the point is, is that, um, um, why did God deal with these cities of refuge? And we'll talk about that next time with maybe some surprising results. We'll talk about, uh, we'll clean up the Levites. They've got these, we've still got 48 cities to allocate to the Levites and talk a little bit more about them. And then we'll have the last couple of chapters, two, three chapters of the book, where Joshua himself, on a couple of occasions actually, but they're lumped together with a few messages at the end, he gives us our final challenge. And that will conclude our survey of the book of Joshua and uh, leave us... Uh, to uh, uh, we'll, 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 we will have, we'll recap too and do some summary. We have a little mystical notes and a few little things. But the real thing is, is what we walk away out of this room with uh, uh, having gained spiritually, practically from Joshua in terms of our walk. The reality of the man, the reality of what he dealt with, that's fun. Uh, but what lessons does the Holy Spirit have in this book for you and I?